Hello, I'm Mike Bishop and I'm going to talk about military personal equipment. So what do I mean by that? While I'll be talking about weapons and armour in other films in the series, there are other items of personal equipment that are distinctive and belong to military apparel which are not strictly weapons and armour. The military belt was one of the most characteristic items of Roman military equipment, not least because the soldier always wore it, whether he was in armour or not. It was one of the principal means for him to personalise his kit and assert his status in public. It provided somewhere to hang his sidearms and was highly decorated with belt plates during the first century AD. Sword and dagger frogs were integral parts of these matching sets of decorative plates because of its role as a weapons belt. Belt plates might be cast and inlaid or embossed with sheet metal, usually copper alloy, and frequently of the rich golden-coloured orichalcum brass, the same metal used in coinage. Cast belt plates could be inlaid with niello, and both cast and embossed plates might be tinned or even occasionally silvered. Rare examples of belt plates were actually made from sheet silver. Sculptural evidence, notably some of the fine tombstones from the Rhineland, suggests that the belt fittings of legionary and auxiliary infantry were similar in the first century AD, and site finds seem to confirm this. One of the most distinctive features of infantry equipment during the 1st and early 2nd centuries AD was the so-called apron. Starting out as just surplus material from a belt with studs on it, it developed into an elaborate and probably quite noisy way a soldier could make his mark. Up to eight straps with studs, usually copper alloy but occasionally silver, with a hinged terminal. The tombstone of Largenius of Legio Secunda Augusta from Strasbourg dates from just before the invasion of Britain and shows the full eight studded straps. There's an example of an apron strud, again with a yellow inlay, and an apron terminal. Studs and terminals are easily mistaken for cavalry harness decoration, although the types of decoration differed and cavalry terminals were not hinged. Key to identifying apron studs are the slightly raised rings underneath their heads. These are concentric to the central shank of the stud. For a brief period in the first half of the 2nd century AD, enamel inlaid belt plates came into fashion for waist belts, but these were soon replaced by a wave of material decorated with openwork designs. During the 2nd century AD, the revolution in casting brought about by the adoption of the two-part mould system saw decorative items and equipment with openwork decoration being widely copied, such as this example here. One of the most distinctive forms of narrow belt plate found so far unique to Britain probably belonged to the cavalry. The long auxiliary cavalry sword, the Spava, was directly inherited from the Celtic horsemen employed by Caesar in Gaul, and with it came a belt which attached to all four rings on the scabbard. The second century saw the traditional tongue and loop buckle begin to fall from favour. Here's an example of a tongue and loop buckle. In its place came symmetrical belt fastenings such as the ring and frame buckles. And this is an example of a ring buckle. In both of these the belt leather wrapped around either side of the buckle and was fastened back on itself with a fungiform stud. Decorative belt plates were no longer fashionable. By the 4th century, tastes had changed again and so-called chip-carved decoration was favoured by military personnel. It was mainly found in belt sets where decorative plates were once again popular and the tongue and loop buckle returned along with decorative strap terminals for the excess belt material which hung through the buckle. Silver inlay might accompany the relief patterns cast into these plates. In the second half of the 1st century AD, infantry began to carry their swords on narrow leather baldricks rather than attached to the waist belt although the dagger remained on the belt. These baldricks might be decorated with studs, like this example. As with the example on the tombstone of the legionary Caius Castricius Victor from Budapest. Due to a simple mistake on a reconstruction painting long ago, cavalry harness fasteners still occasionally get identified as baldric fasteners. However, baldricks did not need a fastener, they slipped easily over the head. The change in infantry use from the short sword or gladius the long sword or spada during the 2nd century AD also saw a revision in the method of carriage. 
New, much broader baldrics were introduced, and the sword was always worn on the left hip, not the right, as was the case with the gladius. The taste for openwork decoration, usually cast, together with that radical change in the method of sword suspension, saw the adoption of more elaborate baldric fittings, consisting of a phalera, or disc, and a rectangular plate hinged to a heart-shaped terminal. These included military mottos, such as Optime Maxime Omnium Militantium Conserva, best and greatest, meaning Jupiter, protect all who serve in the army. Most were of copper alloy, but some, such as an example from Carlisle, were produced in silver. A sword scabbard was essential to protect the blade when a soldier was not actually in combat, but it also offered a large surface area for decoration and thus personalisation. Embossed propaganda motifs, like those on the Sword of Tiberius from the Rhine at Mainz, were as popular as more abstract decoration, like the swirling volutes and tendrils on the Fulham Sword from the Thames, inhabited by butterflies and birds. Scabbard fittings became less highly decorated in the 2nd and 3rd century AD, primarily just cast shapes and strap slides, but this was more than made up for by the increased decoration on baldrics. And here's an example of a cast sword shape from the 2nd century. Clearly the focus of soldiers' tastes had shifted. Simple box or peltate shapes like this one, usually of copper alloy but occasionally bone, protected the point of the sword. Scabbard slides, also sometimes referred to as scabbard runners, were permanently attached to the front of the organic sheath and could range from fairly simple forms up to stylized leaping dolphins. These are found in iron, copper alloy and bone. Shapes were simplified even further in the late Roman period, often simply blanking plates at the end of the organic scabbard, sometimes with some limited form of embellishment. Like sword sheaths, dagger scabbards were also highly decorated during the first century AD. Usually made of iron, although there were copper alloy examples, first century scabbards could be inlaid with silver, gold, enamel and even coral. In contrast, the scabbards of the larger 2nd and 3rd century daggers, like the example from Coptal Court in London, were minimalist in both form and decoration with hardly any variation amongst them. Ironically, they more closely resemble the frame scabbards of Republican daggers. Military cloaks and capes needed brooches and fasteners. This much is made clear by the sculptural evidence as well as the many finds from sites, some of which have known military associations. Knee brooches in the 2nd and 3rd centuries AD as well as the crossbow brooch in the 4th were clearly used for the sargum, the military cloak. The tombstone of an unknown soldier from Camomile Street in London depicts him wearing the pinella, the military cape, and having it fastened at the front by two toggles and two buttons. The buttons here may well be intended to represent the ubiquitous and multi-purpose button and loop fasteners, just one of many classes of artefact which were used by both the military and civilian populations possibly even buying them from the same sources.